I didn't really know what I was going to do once I'd been released. What does this team need to look like? What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? I hope that no one else ever has to go through. This is Hello, everybody, and welcome to Daily Coaching. Daily Coaching are currently hosting a series all around ex-managers and current managers talking about their journeys of how they got into the positions that they were in, um, and also talking about some of the uh, relationships with players as individuals and also with teams as well. Um, and I'm delighted to announce today that with us we have Ross Hamilton, the head coach of Leighton Orient. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Ross like, talk about his journey, but then also kind of just speak about those um relationships with players and teams um, and also through different stages of his managerial career and coaching career. Um, so Ross, massive thank you for having you on here today um, and if you can just yeah, start talking about your journey around how you got into it and then kind of just bringing us up to where we are today. Yeah, so thanks for having me on first and foremost. Um, there's been a number of these done during lockdown. I think we're all becoming experts are looking at a, uh, looking into a screen so now thanks for having me on. It's, um, uh, it's always nice to talk about your, your career and reflect on a few things. So if I can be of help or inspiration to anyone, then obviously it's an even even, even better thing. Um, uh, for me, I, I, like, very proud of my background. Um, like, like I'm so sure everybody is. Um, but I started, like everybody, trying to, trying to be a footballer myself. Um, but realistically, looking back, I don't think that was ever really a possibility. And uh, I was released from Leighton Orient as a kid at, I was 15, 16, just before I was about to leave school. And I was in a bit of a situation where I didn't really know what I was going to do once I'd been released. So um, I was very fortunate at sort of that sort of time. My, dad, my dad's always been into coaching. So it was something I was always quite interested in. But I was lucky that he sort of come to me and said, look, like, all your mates are working in shops or, you know, shoe shops, Tesco's or whatever on a, on a Saturday. Um, rather than going off and doing a job like that, why don't you get yourself doing a little bit of coaching on a Saturday morning? And, and the terminology of coaching is really loose because it was uh, refereeing games, picking kids up, tying up their shoelaces and just trying to give them a good time playing football, four, five, six, up to sort of nine and ten year olds. Um, and it was as loose as that to start with a bit of pocket money and, and a bit of an interest. And um, and it grew quite quickly. So when I, when I left school, I stayed on at college and did um, did an A level. And I went to college with all of the Arsenal youth team at the time. So they were playing and training, and I then did my coaching around my uh, my studies at college. So I was doing a lot of work in primary schools, uh, after school clubs, half term camps, Saturday mornings, as I just mentioned. But again, like. It wasn't this, ever this focus on the coaching. It was about giving the kids a good time. Obviously, from a business perspective, trying to bring them back and make them enjoy playing football and to return and pay for our camps and courses. It was about, it was about that at the front of it all. And I'd like to think it's always been, and has always stayed with me, a big part of my coaching is trying to give people a good time, trying to make them come to work and enjoy what they do. Um, try and be part of something that they really enjoy being part of because I think any of us we enjoy what we do enjoy the way we go about our business I think there's more chance you're going to get better at it and you're going to put that little bit more into it because you let's say you're enjoying it and you're passionate about it so yeah I spent a number of years doing that and, and a real big part of um, my learning and development at that time was going on to like housing estates in East London and working in the ball cages and the uh, like the mugger areas and places like that that are probably a little bit more common theme across the country now but back then quite limited and quite sort of new ideas but going into an environment which was tough environments to win the kids over and win the people over but at the same time it was challenging in terms of limited equipment limited areas never really knew how many players were going to turn up one week you'd have 25 the next week you'd have five or six so you'd have to be quite creative and thought provoking to, to work and think on the spot in order to make sure you were putting on again sessions that the boys were going to want to come back to that might have been the reason why there was only five one week and 20 the week after because of some of my sessions but um massive massive thing for my coaching because i just become so adaptable and i think now one of my things is that um, you never get intimidated by oh i thought i was going to have 12 today and i've only got nine or where's the mannequins or what balls we've got. If you go in our container at our training ground, it's quite limited because I'd like to think we're all quite creative in terms of the work that we can do. Um, 
for, for the players without needing all the you sing all the bells and whistles really. Um, so that was big. For two years as well, volunteering at the academy at the time. So uh, I, I used to go and watch the under nine strain, the 16s, the youth team, the, the under 13s, just to work with all different coaches. And I was really lucky that then it was minimal staff, and I've, I've become sort of that one that oh, the under 13s can't coach can't make it tonight. I'll let Ross take the session, you know. So it was a commitment that I didn't get paid for for two years, but I just loved being part of what what people were doing and seeing different people work. And again, like not necessarily always writing down our cone goes there and putting he goes a yellow bib, he goes a blue bib. It was about the relationships that the coaches built with the kids and how to get the best out of individuals. Uh, that was massive for me. Um, and then to sort of to go through my career a little bit is I, I was fortunate enough that I sort of worked my way through football and the community and, and the academy at the, at the club at the time. And I, I sort of, before E Triple P managed the younger age groups, um, was a bit, I suppose you'd have classed me as a bit of a skills coach. Did like a lot of you know one to one stuff and stuff for the real babies, the six and seven year olds pre academy. They were all words now, but they they didn't exist back then. It was just coaching younger players really. Um, but found myself in the end after I sort of reached sort of twenty five, twenty six, I became. Uh, the head of the club's centre of excellence, so academy now, but centre of excellence at the time, I became head of youth, uh, which was quite a big job for someone of my age. Um, but fascinating. I was the only member of staff, full-time member of staff in that department. Um, so I did the admin. I did, you know, all the all the all the preparations for the thing. I washed the kit. I did you know, every. I, I prepared the training ground, sorted the goals out. It was it was hell of a job, but one that um, massively in the deep end, and one that sort of prepared me for anything. It felt, felt like once I left that behind, it didn't matter what role I ever went into, the pressure of having all of that responsibility uh, at that time was always something that really stood me in good stead. Um, and then after that, I went on to work at Tottenham, which was massive. Um, I left Orient because I felt like I'd sort of reached a bit of a ceiling and I was only really learning from myself. Uh, and I went to work at Spurs where I was really lucky to go and work with people like Chris Ramsey, uh, Alex Inglefall, Perry Suckling, uh, John McDermott, people who are like, you know, real leaders in, in youth development in the country. And to go and work three years with them was, was fantastic. Um, and I did a job which was sort of managing coaches, coach development, and then the, uh, the younger age groups at the academy. Uh, and then after three years, I sort of felt like I'd lost the direction of me being a coach. And I became an organiser and, uh, and a coordinator. And, uh, and someone that would sit down and talk to coaches about their sessions and their development, but never really did anything myself. Yeah. And I was very lucky that I got approached uh, because the under 18 job came up at AFC Bournemouth. Um, so I went down there and it was a fantastic, again, sort of out on my own coaching every day for the first time, you know, working off my own back, really, really good club that was going in a real good direction. The job I, I did only lasted a year. I sort of, I got caught in the crossfire a little bit and, um, in terms of a bit of a power struggle and I ended up losing my job. So, uh, but fantastic priceless in terms of the coaching experience and, and the youth team trained at a different venue to, to the first team at the time. And I used to lose my goalkeepers four days a week. So I, I, um, it was mad that we used to train in like sort of three out of four days that we used to train a week without no goalkeepers. And I developed all these games. Yeah and sessions where I never had any goalkeepers in them. And actually, when I then later down the line started to get goalkeepers in my sessions, I didn't know what to do with them. I had to develop, I had to rethink about how the game needed to look because I'd, I'd done so much without them. Um, but again, it was great in terms of becoming creative with my coaching. Uh, but after we left, I left Bournemouth, I went to Norwich and, and I was in a recruitment role and I was only there for a year. The club got relegated and I was made redundant. But... Um, I was terrible at the job. Recruitment wasn't for me. I watched teams and coaches rather than watching players, which was what my job was. But I, I, I just got bogged down too much with, um, he should have been there and he should have been doing this and he should have been doing that. And seeing where we all come in Norwich, you know. So um, I learned a lot about what different clubs do, but, but not very good at the job. Um, so I went back as I managed a 16 to 18 year old college program and it, 
it was incredible experience. I did 18 months and it was, um, it was, it was, it was a nut house. The college I worked in was completely bonkers. The, there was fights every day. We had stabbings, we had muggings. It was like a version of the English coach Carter. These boys were like all excluded from all the other colleges in the area. And, um, that it was like this big bunch of nutters that all came together on my course. And, um, but they quickly became my nutters and I built incredible relationships with some of them. And, and don't get me wrong, some of them fell off the, off the, off, you know, off the face and have, have ended up in trouble and in prison and stuff like that. But others have come, really come through and come out the other side and have got good jobs and playing football and um, turned out to be really good young, young men. So it was, um, it was a fascinating period just to try and get them to turn up, let alone to try and coach them to begin with was, um, was amazing. And then I was very lucky that, Someone I worked for, Martin Ling, at the time, uh, got the job as um, Swindon Town manager, uh, and he took me uh, as his first team coach. So I was at Swindon for two seasons. Um, first year we did really well, went from being bottom of the league to finishing the mid table, uh, and then a year later we didn't recruit well enough, and, and we were relegated. So um, that saw me out of work again, and. Um, but then I was very lucky that uh, the club, the consortium that took over Leighton Orient and the owners of Leighton Orient now bought the club and Martin became director of football and I was brought back to the club as, as assistant coach. So I've done that job for about three years now. And then um, due to the unfortunate circumstances of losing Justin Edinburgh as the manager after winning the league uh, at this sort of time last year, this last summer, uh, I took over the job as an interim manager or interim head coach. Uh, and then uh, just after Christmas this year, I was uh, I was offered the job on a permanent basis, and 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 here we are today. <laughs> nice. I, I think, and this is again one of the big reasons why I wanted to kind of get you on this discussion is because I think your journey is so genuine. Um, I mean, you know, yeah. you think about some of the journeys that people take, and obviously people take different journeys and different experiences throughout it. But you know, you face all of the things which are current within a lot of people's journeys so you know the redundancies the uh changing and going to different environments so you know moving out of like say for example the london area and going up towards say you know somewhere like swindon and, and bournemouth and these different areas different environments um then coming back down to, to london and, and dealing with the uh environmental factors like you said you know kids who maybe not having the best upbringings and you know no due to their own or whatever but you know you've then got that responsibilities in your hands and you know, they've been given this opportunity to go back into college and then it's like, well, Ross, we want you to try and sort it out for them. So I think that's really, really important. And I've always said about um, footballers that you need to put them in as many different environments and experiences as possible to make them decision makers, to make them problem solvers, to make them just confident enough to be able to deal with any sort of scenario or situation they're faced with, whether that be your technical side of football, whether it be your psychological, your social, your physical. Um, and I think that that's obviously what's, what's come out in your journey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's yeah, the thing, people often forget it. Yeah, and I think what's massive for me is that it's so easy to just look at football and say, yeah, they all earn millions of quid, uh, millions of pounds. Um, they all drive nice cars, live in big houses, live plush lifestyles, and that ain't how it works. You know, yeah. we all aspire to reach those things and become that, but there's a way of getting there. And if that's not, if you haven't had the career to, to give you the platform yeah. you are living a normal life in a different person's world and and that's what it was like for me especially when i sort of jumped into the, the full-time professional environment i think everyone just assumed that you're just like everybody else that's involved in it and you're not i yeah. i had a you know i lost my job at bournemouth and we'd moved to bournemouth me and young family two young kids and my missus and we we bought a house and we had massive responsibilities and all of a sudden a year into it i had no job um, and then the same thing again, I had to come home a year later, drive home from Norwich and say to my missus, it's been made redundant. I haven't been there a year. So I don't walk away with it with a big payoff and, you know, yeah. something to fall back on. So straight away, you're scrambling around looking for work again the next day. And I think it's that that makes you proud. It makes you resilient. And like you said, like when we refer it to your players, it is about going through those setbacks in order to bounce back and, and, and make you stronger whether that means you go back to the jobs that you really wanted to do yeah. or you find another pathway I think you become stronger for it. it ain't great going through it but when you come out of it it really does give you that that resilience and I, I, I've, I've been talking to a friend of mine and we live in we, we live in a nice you know nice part of sort of hearts and on the hearts and Essex border a nice part or a nice place to bring up your kids 
but we grew up in East London and my mate grew up in, in, um, in like Peckham and like south of the river. And he talks about how he wants his kids to have more character and more personality and be able to deal with these setbacks. But I say to him, they're not going to have the same experiences as you because they don't live there. Yeah. So you bring your kids away from that because you want to protect them and give them a nice, nice lifestyle. But at the same time, you can't then say, I want them to live a life yeah. like a kid from Peckham because they're not living it. So, yeah. you know, they'll have little traits that they pick up along the way, but they're going to be different kids to what you are because they grow up in a different area. So I think it is about, it is about how you, you know, how you go through those scenarios. And like I say, I'm proud of what I've done and how, I've, how and where I've got to. It's now for me trying to, um, to think positively about the industry that I'm in now and try to not just conform all the time. I think you, yeah. I mean, I'm lucky that I'm in this position. So now I want to make the most of it. I want to be as successful as I can. But at the same time, I, I want to do the things that I always got told I couldn't do or you shouldn't do or things that players shouldn't do. You know, things you were asking them. And I would ask a 14, 15 year old, 15, 20 years ago to go and get it off the goalie. And people were saying to me, oh, I played 20 years in League Two. I never, t- I never, never got it off the goalie. And I'd be like, well, don't make it right, does it? Yeah. It doesn't make it any... Like, I'm trying to develop the best, best players I can. And if I can develop one to play in the Champions League and he's, and he's up there with the best players in the world, then fantastic. Now, if he doesn't and, and, and he's, you know, he's going to reach a different ceiling, then, then I'll adapt to what I ask of him as we go. But I might as well aspire for the best and then, you know, like I say, taper it as, as we go along. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Now, well, you make a really interesting point, and uh, maybe you mentioned it at the beginning as well, about... So, obviously, when you're working with different players, and again, see everyone's journeys and experiences are different, but you sometimes see uh, managers within the game go into a position where, you know, they may have been the next footballer themselves, or they may have just come into positions, but they haven't worked throughout all age groups. Now, interestingly, because sometimes when I'm mentoring coaches, you know, they always want the older age groups. Oh, can I work with the 18s? Can I work with the 17s, 16s? And the thing is, is that, listen, you know, everyone can always have room to learn. But I think people perceive that these 18 year olds, you know, they've got the knowledge. So it's just kind of getting them to play. Whereas, I mean, myself, I, I enjoy coaching the five year olds just as much as I coach the older ones. Because yeah, actually, yeah. at a five year old, you're getting to teach them the fundamentals. You're kind of, listen, you, you won't be the most memorable coach because by the time they're 18, they would have had thousands of coaches. But you're the one who's kind of, you know, implemented those key core fundamental skills for them to yeah. enjoy it and love and it. And you're really. the one that makes them carry on playing. You're yeah. the one that makes them start and carry on playing. And I think that's the big thing for me. I still coach uh, on a Saturday morning. I coach, um, well, I started, started off my little boys team, but now it's become like a bit of a soccer school type thing. And I, and I still do that now. And we have three and four year olds that come and they join in with their parents. So it's not coaching three year olds, but the, the, the dad sort of join in with them to give them that sort of starting block of, of playing football. And I, I, I love it, so that's why I do it. And I turn up there on a Saturday morning and some of the dads go to me, what, what are you doing? You've got a game this afternoon. But I'm taking my little boy so I'd stand and watch him if I wasn't. And two, yeah. I love doing it and I love, I love having that influence on other, on other people. So I think it's, it is about that, having that passion about giving those, like you say, they're going to have thousands of coaches along their journey, but it's trying to, trying to give them a great experience to start from, teach them all the little things that they, you know, they're going to, in their early stages of learning before it, before it starts to get a little bit more serious. And I do think we have a tendency, I can only really talk for the people in this country, but we have a tendency that we think that if we know about football, we know about everything in football. And if you haven't worked with the buggies in exactly the same way as if you haven't worked with the first team, you never really know, yeah. you know, they're all just opinions until you can really say that you've, you know, that you've tried to influence all different age groups. Yeah, totally. And I think as well, it goes back to uh, the sort of like the FA's four corners where you look at, like I said, the psychological side, because actually if you can't manage a group of four year olds who don't want to play football, who don't want to be there and you're literally just trying to control the group, let alone give any sort of technical information, then, you know, yeah. how are you meant to you know, go into an environment where there's, there's men who are, like I said, very opinionated. You know, this is, like I said, this is the way I've been doing it for all this time. And yeah, it's that tough balance. I think it's I think so interesting, but I think it's so important yet as well. Um, I was going to say as well, I mean, you mentioned it at the, right at the beginning about sort of like, you know, just when you was doing the um, Saturday uh, sessions when you when you first set out, um, implementing fun within it. Um, 
I was going to say what kind of change will changes through the different environments. So when you're doing the sort of community stuff, when you first all started out and going into the academies and going into the professional game, what's kind of changed, but then potentially at the same time stayed the same as well. Cause I, I, I imagine however old players get, they still enjoy playing football and it's being fun. Yeah. So we, uh, I think enthusiasm is always there for anybody yeah. in anything that you do. And I think, if you're passionate about something, the enthusiasm always exists. And like I say, when I, when I go and work with a three and four year olds on a Saturday morning, I still have as much enthusiasm as ever yeah. to do it. Um, because you want, if you want them to have that back or give that back, then, you know, you've got to implement it and, 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 and show it yourself. So I think enthusiasm every single day is hard um, yeah. because you're going into an environment, especially for me now that is pressurized and, you know, you're the one with a, with a, with a lot of the weight on your shoulders. And if it's not going great, um, you've still got to show that energy and enthusiasm and passion about what you do, even though you might be a bit bogged down or you're a bit bit tired. Um, you you still got to try to set those barriers and set those levels. So I think enthusiasm is a massive one. I think that with um, with the fun element, I think it's about trying to find the balance. So for me, I don't go to work every day and make it fun. You know, all singing, all you know, everyone giggling and laughing. It's not yeah. fun like that. It's an enjoyment level to the session that you think about your sessions of. Right, like, we might need to work on finishing today, but we're going to work in a manner where it's quite light-hearted or it's quite energetic. Um, we were talking about our warm-ups for tomorrow, and we said, right, it's going to be quite high tempo. You know, quick touches, punching it into a mini goal, something that the boys just going to energise the boys. No, no information, no talking about how they receive it, how they shoot, how they dribble. Just get them going. And so some days for me, it's about trying to get the balance of um, what do they need and what do they want. Um, I don't think we can go in every day and it be like coach, 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 yeah. coach, because you'll just lose the players and they won't, they won't enjoy it. And it's very, very tough on to focus to that level. So it's about, for me, trying to get that balance of, Today's a day for, for the players, an enjoyment one, a high energy, maybe a bit of a shorter session, um, a few different activities to try to, you know, try to bring the energy and raise the, the energy levels for, for the players. And then it's getting the balance right of, yeah, so we've done that today, but tomorrow it might be a bit more tactical, a bit slower, a bit more information, a bit more thought that goes into it from them um, in order to, 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 to get the balance right. So I think, it, I think the enthusiasm and, and drawing people into doing something that they enjoy every day are the biggest things for me. And I yeah. think that, that then adds on to the staff. So, you yeah. know, again, comparing it to where I started, but to have the staff energised on a week-long half-term holiday camp, nine till three, same group of kids for for a week, you needed to try and freshen it up and keep it energe energetic for the coaches in order to have that effect on the kids. And it's the same with my staff now. I constantly have to find ways to get my analysts doing different work to, to energise him, to get him thinking outside the box so that the boys are constantly, you know, when they come into a meeting with him, it's different. It's not the same. It's short, it's sharp, it's snappy. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then that, that, that corresponds to, to, to all the other staff that you have around you. And then ultimately as well, most notably, the, the coaching staff that you work with every day. Yeah, and that's, I agree. I think it's that fun balance of because you know sometimes you need to implement things because they just have to, that's the way it has to be, and I think players are receptive yeah. and understanding of that. But yeah, I agree. I think also as well, people like the element of surprise as you know, what's terms of what's coming next, or am I getting ownership on this? And I think like you just said there, just through having discussions with your players about tomorrow's warm up, you know, they're going to be going, they're going to be thinking about it before they actually go into it, which will be good because then, like you said, it just sets sets the environment. Um, with that. Do you uh, kind of, obviously, you know, people have sort of philosophies and, and ways they play and, and ideas that they want to put into the club. Um, but do you sort of do things on sort of, say, for example, a three, six, 12 month basis? Or is it very much just look, you know, we're going to have to look at the position, the situation, the scenario we're in after a game and then maybe have to change the, the session based, based on that? Um, I think what came around for me is I didn't have that when I, when I was the interim manager. I got offered the job permanently and I said I didn't want to do it. And they, the club brought in a new manager for a very short period before I took the job yeah. on full time. And I never had any clarity whatsoever when I was interim manager as to what I wanted my team to look like. So I'd spent all my life coaching, watching football, analysing. And then all of a sudden I got into the position and I was so off the cuff. And when I think back now, I gave the players absolutely no chance whatsoever. So 
the, the, the board at the club liked what I'd implemented and what the way we were trying to work and, and you know, the use of sports science and analysis and, and that sort of thing. But actually, day to day, it, when I think back now, it was so hard to analyse what my team was supposed to be doing. Yep. So it must have been impossible for the players to go out every week knowing how to go and put in a performance because one week we play 4 3 3, then we play 3 5 2. And we never chopped and changed the formation too much at the beginning. It was more what I was asking of them. So then, then when I got the job on a permanent basis, it was almost like, right, what does this team need to look like? What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? Um, where have we fallen short in terms of getting promoted from the National League into League Two? And what's made us not make that gap or that step up well enough? So I've, we play 4-3-3 uh, now, or played 4-3-3 at the back end of last season. And... It became about, you know, this is the responsibility of these players in these positions. But then, what are their strengths and weaknesses? So, I think for me, what, what now I've started to realise is that um, you have a philosophy. I want my team to dominate the ball. I want us, on the whole, to, to press and be aggressive at the top end of the pitch uh, in order to keep teams away from our goal. As simple as that, because I don't want to put, you know, the defenders and, and the and, and the uh, and, and pressure among, on top of ourselves to concede chances. So you know, there's those principles in your in my philosophy, if you if you like. But I do think it's very important at the level that I'm, I'm at now that you go into working with a group of players with an open mind. So for me to say I love three five two is foolish because I'm not working at a level where I can go right. I'm the manager. Go and get me three centre halves that can play in the back three. I need two wing backs. I have to work with the players that I've got and hopefully I'm in the club for a period and longer, longer, longer period of time and you shape the squad as to how you want it as you go. But when you're given a group of players or you're, you're given a job um, to go and do, you have to look at what's best for that group and what, what suits those individuals. So I would love my team to dominate the ball from the goalkeeper. We've got a goalkeeper that can, um, he's outstanding with his feet. But we haven't always got the centre-halves in the team that are comfortable at doing that. So we have to think practically of, well, how do I get my team up the pitch with a goalkeeper that's good with his feet? Do you know what I mean? So I think there's lots of different ideas that, in an ideal world that I don't do at Leighton Orient because players' strengths and weaknesses uh, or the group's strengths and weaknesses don't match up with that. So I think you then have to think practically. And then I think the best managers in the lower levels are the ones that can get the best out of the players. Yes that they've got sitting in front of them at one time. So probably don't answer your question outright, but I do think dominating the ball is becoming more of a key element of football, even at League Two level now, which probably wasn't the case in the past. I do think it's about having um, you know, energy and, and being able to, to not always suppress, but that being a big part of your game. The athleticism in League Two is much, much better than it, than it, than it has ever been in history. So I think the game has evolved massively. So, like I say, without probably answering your question directly, there's, there's, there's no key elements for me and my team. But I think it can it can all depend on, on the scenario you find yourself in and the players that you've got. Yeah, no, I think it's a great insight. I think, yeah, I totally re resonate with that. Sorry, is that, like, like you said, is that player relationship again? If you don't understand the players you have with you, and I think, you know, it's in football so opinionated and you get people who may have loads of experience, people who have little experience and saying, why aren't you doing this? And you should be playing that style and should be playing that formation. But like you said, until you actually go in there and the thing is, is that they don't know those players as well as you do. You're the ones who are in there day in, day out. Even little things like, you know, you know if that person's been feeling sick the night before or you know if that person's had a yeah. great day and that person hasn't had a great day it's, it's things like that and I think that you know like I said in an ideal world it's right I'm going to do this this is my formation this is how we're going to play but in an, in, in the real realistic world it doesn't work like that and you know like you said no. you're just having to react to what you have in front of you and, and, and how you have to deal with that and you you sign players off of you know watching a lot of videos going to yeah. watch him play for other teams and you think oh, I like that about him I like that about him and then you get to work with him and you realise that his strengths outweigh you know, different weaknesses that might yeah. fit, not fit in that particular system that you have in mind. I think one real big one that real fitted with me last year was I had a, a, a striker that a lot of people were going to me, why would you play him wide? Like, he, he's, he's a striker, he plays down the middle. I sat yeah. down with the lad, said to him, where do you want to play? And he was like, wide. I hate having my back to goal. Like, the ball comes to me over a long distance. I can't, I, I, 
it's not my strength to feel where the defenders are. I like being wide because I can see that yeah. he was a big boy, so he can edit against fullbacks. But all them things came came into his game. But yeah, I'd walk outside and fans would be going to me. Why are you playing him, Wyatt? Why are you playing him on the wing, not down the middle? You'd be like, well, go and ask him. He doesn't want to play then. You know? <laughs> like something as simple as that, you know? Yeah. And, and it is it's about then. It's a, it ain't even about being any good as a coach. It's about it's about putting people in the right positions and giving them the best opportunity to perform. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And, and kind of looking at it as a kind of whole, really, but then like, you have to react based on the situation and scenarios. Um, who have you kind of, or who has been sort of like influences towards you throughout your sort of career? Has it been sort of, you know, other coaches who have given you sort of ideas from what you've seen? Because like you said, you've built quite a lot of relationships along the way. Um, you obviously as well mentioned about like, your, you know, your dad who encouraged you to get involved into, into coaching. Um, I don't know if people can take it away from, you know, peers and family. Yeah, what was kind of the, yeah. the real influences along your, your journey? I think um, massively my dad, because my dad, my dad was into coaching and he got me into coaching. And, but the, the real um, great thing about my dad is that I don't really talk to him about four four two or right backs and left backs and this player cutting in on his right foot. I just he talks to me a lot about management of people and about um, about how you deal with people day to day and, and that sort of thing. I had a boss at um, Leighton Orient Football in the community, my my first boss, and he was unbelievable with people. And again, like never never really have talked to me about I'll put this cone there, make your areas yeah. bigger, no, nothing like that. It was just about his enthusiasm for the kids and the parents and the relationships that he built. So he was a real big influence on me from that point of view. Um, Chris Ramsey was a massive football influence on me. He was my first coach. He released me, my first coach, but he was my coach at Leighton Orient. Then he released me at Leighton Orient, but then I went back to work with him at Spurs and he's someone now that still picks the phone up to me and, and vice versa. Uh, Alex Inglethorpe was incredible when I worked with him at Spurs. I knew him as a player at Orient, um, but when I worked with him at Spurs, real detail thinker, deep thinker about football um, and about the intricacies of the game. And I, I think probably from Al, I really learned about the real detail that can go into the, you know, working with top players because obviously in his youth team, he would have people like Harry Kane, Ryan Mason. So I think that was, Al was really, really good on a football front like that for me. Um, and Martin Ling's been a massive influence on me because he, he took me to Swindon. He, he's the director of football that I work with at, at Leighton Orient now. So um, again, not someone that I sit and talk to about systems and formations, but someone that if I, you know, if I'm having a difficult conversation with someone, I'm going to leave someone out or um, someone might need a you know a bit of time off with a family. I talk to him about things like that and it's a real big, real big help and a guide like that. Dean Smith, he's obviously Aston Villa manager now and, and Dean's someone that I call upon um, with, with all different ideas really and he, he, he gives me support um, like that. Um, and my missus was the one that told me to take the job so I probably um, I probably got her to pat on the back for that. He's sitting over the other side of the table so I better <laughs> move. But no, I think um, ultimately there comes sometimes you, you're in these decisions and not sure if it's the right thing best thing for you you know you're putting your family at, at risk by potentially putting yourself out there to be shot down so yeah. she was a big part of almost like you know life's too short you know sometimes you've got to make these big decisions and put your neck on the line and all, the, all those cliches but they're big things as to as to making that big step into into the job I'm in now so uh, a lot of good people along the way I'm sure I've missed one or two but <laughs> some real good people along the way but like I said to you there a lot of them a lot of, do you know what's well? A lot of my footballing influences have come from working with people that I don't think were very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. People that have got, I won't mention no names because it's yeah, not no. fair, but people have got incredible standing in the game. They've had unbelievable football careers. Things I could win championships that I could never, never dream of winning. But some of the things I used to listen to them say to the players and the sessions they'd do and the things they'd, comment on in training I'd be like wow like, yep. I wouldn't do it like that now, yeah. now each to their own but for me it didn't work so I think those are things as well that you have to influence you respect yeah. people's decisions and the way they go about it but at the same time it's not always something that you agree with so it's about then tweaking it to try to put it right isn't it yeah no t totally and I think as well the, the sort of you know difference in the influences that you mentioned you know like I said to you before about family I think family is important because ultimately you, know, you want to do it for your own selfish reasons in terms of building your own career but you're doing it for your family and you know you're yeah. you've got people around you you know it might be friends or whatever who are obviously like you know 
really excited for you. So there, the motivation there. And I think, like you said, it's in terms of you taking what you feel is right from these other influences, such as, like, you know, you said, you'll find some coaches who, when I'm mentoring and I'm, I'm working with coaches, I'm seeing some, which I'm like, wow, it's incredible. They, they may have only just started out within the game, but you know what? Some of their personal characteristics, I'm taking that. I'm, I'm trying to see if I can if I can put that into myself and build on that because the players respond so well. Like I said, there's others where you look yeah. and you think, I don't know if I do that in, in that particular way, but I think it does help to build and shape you along with those experiences that you may have had along the way. You know, the other one as well that I, I haven't mentioned is, is, is the players. Yeah. It's yeah. the players yeah. that ultimately you're working for. And when I got the job at, at, at Leighton Orient, so many people, so many of the negative comments that I got were um, my relationship. I was too close to the players. I was this, I was that with the players. I think, was well, that a bad thing? I've, I've spent three oh, years with most of these players, working with them as, their, as the assistant manager, built incredible relationships with them. Is that a bad thing? Because like, no I've got good relationships with the people I go to work with. All right, my job then or now is to have different relationships with them. I probably can't go around their house for a coffee or go and have lunch with them straight after training. You know, my, my relationships become a little bit different in the way that I do that, but still built up an unbelievable amount of respect between one another. Yeah. Still 100% go and sit and have a chat with them. I'd be crazy to try and turn that upside down and just manage like Brian Clough or go and manage like to yeah. Alex Ferguson because they haven't got those relationships so I've got to work the best way that I can and I think the players influence that you know, whether it's a six year old or, or a 35 year old you, you've got to get the best out of the people that you're working with and, and, and having good the, the, the best type of relationship to suit you and the player is, is, is the one that you're searching for isn't it? Yeah, 100%. And I think as well, the important thing is that you, you know, every player is very going to have a different type of relationship with you. So, you know, obviously depending on the type of characters that they are and, and, and what they need. I mean, like, you know, when I've done some interviews with players before, some of them say, oh, you know, you need to give me a bit of a kick up the backside. Others are like, put a shoulder around me. And, you know, like you said, you've obviously been with them for such a long time. Yeah, how, how, is, how on earth is that a negative thing that you know them so well yeah. that you can supply them with what, what they need? So. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what so many people think that man management is scream and shout at people or cuddle them. Yeah. There's nothing else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas yeah. I know that if I walk into training tomorrow and I didn't think much of someone's you know, player A's performance in training today, and I walk past him and go, what love old crap that was yesterday. And I know that I'm going to get a what? Like <laughs> reaction. But I'm going to get a reaction. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Whereas with the next one, I'm going to walk and say to him, Come in a minute, like, and I and I walk around the training ground with him to explain yeah. to him why I thought his 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 performance was great or not so great. Like, it, it isn't just about tell everyone they're useless or give everyone a cuddle. That's the two ways that you work with everyone. You got there's more to yeah. it than that. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think it's, it's, it's that thing of just knowing what they need at that appropriate time. So it makes total sense. Yeah. Um, in terms of your whole career, then, um, sort of what would you say has kind of been the standout point for you so far? Um, would it have been something like obviously, you know, the recent situation, or would it be, you know, you know when you're first starting out and maybe the first five year old that you coached? I think. Um... I think a bit of both, really. I think, obviously, t this is the biggest position that I've had. I would say that the biggest uh, in what I would regard as like my professional football career, I would say the biggest moment, and I, and I grouped the two together, was winning the league, uh, the winning the National League with Leighton Orient, and then the pass, you know, the, the sudden terrible passing of Justin Edinburgh. That was, that was something that, um, that I'll never forget. It's something that I don't think... I wish that I hope that no one else ever has to go through because it's um, you know the extreme highs, the fantastic relationship that you build with someone, and then you know any loss he's, he's obviously tough to deal with. But to see he's, to build relationships with his family and go through all of that um, is a pivotal moment in my career because it's also ended up you know I, I, we've done a great job to get promoted in a very very short period of time at Leighton Orient, thinking that that could potentially be our pathway of working together in the future. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you find yourself standing on the touchline replacing him. So that's always going to be something that I think I'll always look back on. But I do think it is about, um, about going back to where, where you started and having real strength and desire and beliefs about what, it, what you do and what you yeah. believe in. Do you know what I mean? They, they deviate and, and, and you manipulate it. As you you know, as you learn more and you get more experience in your job, but 
it's about like it's about the things that are important to you and, and I'd like to think that when I you know when, when I first started I you know I had the same enthusiasm same energy and and, and, and love for football as as I, as I do now do you know what I mean and I think that's that's um that so that that sort of twofold really I think the start of it and, and going into it we, I never went into any job I never went into any role thinking this is where I want to get to it was like I just want to be really good at that or oh yeah I just really want my my half-term football course to have the most kids on it or you know wh whatever the the motive was at the time it was never oh I'll do this job because then when I leave there I'll get this one or this person will get the sack and I'll get that one it was never none of that was ever in place so I'm quite proud of the fact that I've sort of followed what I thought was right and there's been you know bumps in the road along the way but but, but you sort of find find your route to, to, to somewhere that I'm really proud to be at the moment. Yeah, nice. I, I think you're right there in terms of, like you said, finding the motiva even motivation, but the at that present moment in time, looking at it in that, that sense rather than the, the, the sense of, oh, I could be doing this or I could reach to there. Because at the end of the day, you know, you're going to find your, your sort of internal motivations, whether, like you said, you're working with a five-year-old. Can I just get them to maybe kick a ball? You know, when you're working with professional players, it's like, can I get them to potentially win win championships? And I think whatever level you're at, whichever environment you're within, you can always find something which you can work towards, whether it be as an individual or, like you said, even from a community point of view. And let's be honest, get as many children as you can on the half turn camp. Everyone's winning because you've got yeah. children to coach and, and the organisation's earning money. So, you know, it's it's so... It's those individual and those team team goals, and I think that that does carry out throughout, like you said, the whole the whole journey really, which is obviously a nice continuation to have. Um, but yeah, but um, looking at it in kind of in terms of um, uh, advice point of view, and this and some people say, well, don't give advice, but just so sort of through your own experiences and things such as that. Um, what kind of advice would you give towards two people really? So players who potentially might be going into coaching or want to go into coaching or managing, because obviously we know it's a it's a common thing which is happening now, um, and it you know it has its benefits and it has sometimes its disadvantages, but it happens. Um, and also from a uh, sort of coaching perspective. <laughs> Um, people who might want to become managers, um, what would kind of would you say in terms of to be aware of um, in terms of managing and coaching of players, but then also the industry as a whole? I think um, the first thing is you've got to get your hands dirty. I think um, the, I'm in a lucky position of working with a lot of senior players, or have done over the last few years, and they come over and they referee a small-sided game, and it's like wow, I've <laughs> spent my career moaning at the refs in or moaning at the coach that the ball's a yard out. Like, I don't realise how nitpicky players are. And I think it's until you go out and get your hands dirty and get amongst it and put in the hours. It's like anything. It's not just football yeah. coaching, is it? If you want to be successful at anything, you've got to go out and put the time in. And I think it is, for me, for a player that's transitioning from, from player to coach or, or wants to get into coaching, it is about getting those experiences and dealing with scenarios and you know, I've had I've had players of real wealth, real wealths of experience come in and do their first four, sort of few sessions, and I say to them, right, you've got twelve players. I want you to do a you know a, a four goal game, something really simple, and then all of a sudden someone picks up an eagle, and they the group go over, and they've only got eleven, and they're looking at me going, hold on a minute, you said we had twelve, and you think yeah. they're things that me and you as coaches just go like, yeah, just put in one and one in as a spare man or a floater yeah. or play five v four, have bounce players, whatever it might be. But what would you know that? You yeah. don't know that because you haven't been doing it. You've only just been told to go and stand on the end or be the, be the floater. Right? So I think it's until you get, get you know, go and get your hands, hands dirty and get amongst it. And, and, and it's the only way to learn. You can read as many books, yeah. watch as many YouTube clips as you want. But until you're standing out there and it goes wrong and you've got to adapt it or it goes well and it finishes too quickly or it, you haven't got the progressions in your set. Now, all those things are... are um, especially you know, the, the more experienced players that you work with, whether that's, an, when I say experience, I'm talking about uh, working with a 10-year-old at an academy or, yeah. you know, or it, it's about the, when you're working with people that know they have expectations and your session needs to be, you know, ready for, to, to, to cope with the level of player that you're working with. So I think that's, that's massive. Um, sorry, what for the question that you said there about, it was, um, it was regarding... Sorry, what was the back end? It was so kind like of just in sort of industry itself. as a whole, really. So, I mean, obviously, kind of, as yeah. you said, oh, the, yeah. the differences of, you know, let's be honest, I mean, I face it in terms of my journey as well, redundancies. You know, someone's probably not expecting that. They're thinking, yeah. well, I'm getting this dream job. All of a sudden, the funding's cut. So, yeah, kind of what just to kind of yeah. be aware well, I of. It, I, I think without, 
I think massively in 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 that term is he's he's cutthroat, and and I yep. think that's that is something that you have to accept. And if you're not willing to accept the fact that there's, you are going to lose your job at some stage, even if it's like for me, I was working in an academy yep. as a recruitment officer for Norwich. Never within a minute did I think oh, I've got to look over my shoulder, yep. I'm going to lose my job. So doesn't really matter what level you're in especially at the moment you know there's cuts coming yeah. in there and everywhere so it's ruthless um so you have to be careful for that i think the major thing that i see now from a lot of um i don't want to, when i say young coaches that, that's not me talking people down because of their age i'm saying new people that are new to coaching yeah. you know young, it could be it could be 45 but only in, only been coaching a couple of years so I, but what i really find is that so many people have like the end goal in mind and it's like, I'm, the amount of people that pick the phone up to me and go, oh, can we do something like this? And they'll say to me, I want to be a manager one day. And I say to them, whoa, 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 whoa. hold on a minute. Like, it's not as easy as that. Like, yeah. There's millions of people who want to get into this position. And you've got to find your way to, you know, the other question I get is, oh, how would you get into this? And you think, no, how you get into this is by going out there and working hard. Yeah, there's an element of knowing the right people sometimes or... Um, being in the right place at the right time, you know, whatever phrases people might throw out, you still got to be good. Yep. Commitment yep. into it. You still got to work hard. And I think sometimes having an end goal, nothing wrong with it. People have aspirations and ambitions. I didn't. So it wasn't like I was always thinking that's part of my plans. One day I want to be a manager. I didn't look and think like that. So I was, I'm fortunate that I've got to where I am. But I do think, although, you know, you might have an end goal or an end target in your mind, it's, can't always be the be all and end all there's ways and means of getting there and you've got to put the time in to achieve it and be ready to deal with the setbacks because I say for me you know going into this job I thought if I get the sackers you know and fail very quickly as a late and orient manager it's very hard for me to find a, a way back into it you know and, yeah. and whether that's to be a manager or something else um, so you have to sort of bear all of those things in mind because the game does quickly move on and, and I do think that there is always someone bigger and better than you out there. There'll always be a bigger better manager with more experience or um, you know more skill, you know different qualities that, that that's got more to offer than, than than you have. There'll always be a new kid on the block, you know, ready to change it. You know, youngest manager in the league. There'll always be someone ready to replace you and people that are thinking new and every new new um, opinions and ideas. So you've always got to be on your toes because you only have to look at someone like Eddie Al or someone I've, yeah. I've worked for and I, and I look up to. It can change so quickly and then all of a sudden, the, you know, the hero of a football club is no longer there no more and, and everyone's looking around thinking, well, where did that come from? So, you know, the game's full of surprises. So I think you've always got to be prepared for that. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic advice. And I think the key thing there as well, about like you said, you, you know, it's true. You do get a lot of from the novice coach of just coming into it and thinking, you know, right, day one, I'm doing my level one, but, you know, by day X, this is where I want to be. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with having aspirations, yeah. but, you know, like Probably. I said, which is important about your journey, which you've taken, there's been so many ups and downs and, you know, it's it's brilliant because, again, you build and you learn from those experiences. Um, and like I said, sometimes it might be the right time, right place. Sometimes it might be wrong time, wrong place. And I think, you know, you're only going to be able to learn and understand you know what what what's your own really and like you said you found it so that you've created different experiences enjoyed it doing the five-year-olds enjoyed it doing the, the first teams and I think that's why it's important because otherwise if you only have that end goal in sight you, you're going to find that coaching five-year-olds a really hard graft and probably not going to enjoy it and actually it's probably putting the children's like in worse in a worse state because they're the ones who need yeah. that vital coaching so yeah. this is about respecting all of those environments and I think you know, a good friend of mine is going for a redundancy at the moment, and and the, and the one thing he, he said to me was like, "How was it when you, when you were going for it, that pressure and you know whatever else?" I said, "Everyone tells you, ah, oh, you're going to be stronger for it. You'll come through the other side. Uh, everything happens for a reason, and all those sorts of things. But yeah. while you're in it, you can't see that. Yeah. You can't see it. It's not till you're on the other side, and you can go, oh blimey, yeah, that was a bit tough. Or you know, this is how I dealt with that scenario. But while you're in it, it you know, you, you don't know whether." You don't know whether you're coming or going, yeah, so it's about building up that resilience. And until you go through something, you you know you, you don't know exactly how you're going to react. Yeah, no, totally. Well, listen, Ross. So I won't take up any more of your time. Fantastic insight into your journey, and like I said, I think it was so important for me to get you on here because of the type of journey that you have had. And like I said to you earlier, on, I think you're so genuine, pure as well. And you know, I think there's a lot of people who start out within coaching, like you said, within communities, and think, you know, is there any 
insight into how I'm going to be able to do this. And like I said, everyone's journey is going to be different, but I think, like I said, the journey you have taken is incredible. And obviously, it's not over yet, so which is brilliant as well. So yeah, no, I, no, hopefully not. Hopefully no. not. But I think no, I think that is it, and that's what it's about. It's about keep. It's yeah. about keeping going. If you have got an end goal in sight, it's about keep aiming and working as hard as you possibly can to achieve it. And you know, not not throwing the towel in, or not giving up when it don't go yeah. right, or you don't get there as quickly as you want, because there'll be different diversions and different ways of getting there. So thanks for thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. And like, like I said to you right at the beginning, if uh, if I've changed one person's thinking or, or supported someone that, that's listening, then and uh, we, we, we've done done something good for the day, haven't we? Yeah, no, exactly. And listen, I reckon they will. I reckon there'll be a lot of people who take a lot away from it. So, you know, thanks to yourself and, and, and for the insight. And, um, yeah, I, listen, I hope you will for, for, for the upcoming season. And um, I'm sure that, yeah, it's going to be a good, good campaign. So, no worries. So, so. No worries. Cheers, Ross. Thank you very much for that, all right? Top man. Cheers. Take care.